Okay, thank you so much for uh, coming today on this early rainy morning. Um, yeah, so today, the plan for today roughly is to give you a really fantastic tool to decide what type of uh, surface you see when you look at the polygon. Let me remind you what I tried to convince you last time. Um, a second. Maybe this is better. Okay. Um, so last time we were doing this, well, idea where we're following this idea that we can describe surfaces by just looking at flat objects. So rectangles, or five guns, six guns, seven guns, uh, those guys. So here as a reminder, how do we go from a flat thing, like a piece of paper, to something that is not flat, um, like, for example, a torus. And it's really just identifying edges. So you really take it into your hand, and you bend it up. I really like this animation, so I will play it again. So we bend it up, glue it together, we get a cylinder first, and then we identify the next one as well, and we get our friend the swim ring. Right? So um, really beautiful. And it also works the other way around. If you forgive me that the animation is not perfect, that you kind of, the hole is kind of lost. There's still a hole, but it's, it's, kind of, it's not really nice to animate here. Um, but anyway, if it bends up, you will see the hole once again, and it will close up nicely into our friend the torus. Okay. So that was all good. And then I kind of left on this note that, well, what, what will happen is we need to kind of decide when we see such a picture like this, um, what is it actually as a surface? So here I just did one step. So we started here. And remember that the rule is, or the game, maybe I should use something like red, that if you exit, let's say, through I, you come in through I again, because there's a paired edge um, II. And I could just take the surface. I have just two pieces of paper, but I identify I and I. So I can just take them in my hand and put them together, and I would get this surface here, okay. where I've indicated the cutting line in the middle. That's where I glue I and I together. Um, and here, as you can see, adjacent to I is B and A, and that's A and B, oh, sorry, A and B here, and here it's uh, A and H, and here it's indeed H and A again. So I really just glued together uh, the two surfaces, and you would read along the edges, you would see that this, one of them is the left side, let me see which one is which, one of them is the left side, and one of them is the right side. So this one here is this one, and this one here is this one. So what we really want is kind of an, a nice uh, method to now just decide by just looking at this picture what, what surface is that actually. Right now that's really not clear at all. It could be essentially anything because there will be so many more identifications going on. You could see a GG edge here, for example. Uh, they would be glued together and an AA edge, so it's, it's not so clear. Um, but today I'll show you an, an absolutely fabulous method how to do it, and it's essentially perfect. It's not quite perfect. I think next week we'll make, so next time we will make it perfect, but it, it's absolutely fantastic. So whenever someone asks you the question, what type of surface is this, there will be a straightforward kind of algorithm you need to run, and in order to kind of decide what it is, um, which is kind of a really fantastic outcome of the story, if you just think of this as, well, we are studying kind of complicated objects. We have seen very complicated objects, like the projective plane. And in the end, we get a, an algorithmic answer where you essentially just need to count. Right? And today, I will show you what we want to count in this setting. OK. Let me um, get some jargon going, because I'm going to use that all the time. And because we have two types of edges. I will call them free edges, and I will call them paired edges. Remember that they only appear once or twice with a label like A or AA, and I just call them free, well, if they appear once, and I call them paired if they appear twice. So that's the, the jargon, free, paired. Okay. And the boundary of my surface, and I will show you later, a bit later, 
uh, hopefully a convincing illustration why this is true, is the union of the free edges. So if you think about the paired edges, they're always glued together. So let me go back to my previous picture. Um, let's get rid of all the drawings. So here's a paired edge, I and I. And paired really means that the, the edge is essentially not there. You can pass through. Remember this animation um, with the computer game we played, where we just can pass through the bottom of the screen and come in to the top of the screen. Right? So this is paired edge. It's clearly not a boundary. You just pass over it. Uh, let me try to find a non-free edge here. So the, the edge C is free. This one is free. Uh, how can we see that? Well, uh, as far as I can see, there's no other edge C. Okay. So it's free. And what does it mean? Well, this means if you really want to exit your screen here, there's no other C to enter again, so you really bump your head. You just run into C. And you bump your head. So this is really a boundary. So the free edges is where you can't exit. You just bump your head. And the paired edges are kind of the computer screen jumping over edges. And this, the, the free ones will form the boundary. So we can almost kind of read off already what the boundary is by looking, by just checking which, appears, which edge appears twice and which edge appears once. There's already a, quite a good start, actually. And I call them, as I said, free and paired, uh, respectively. And the boundary cycle is that whatever is formed um, from the free edges. We'll have a nice example in a second. So here's an example of something that has a boundary. So if we would live on the disk, right, the disk, we would live on the disk, then we, we, we would always bump our head if we would try to walk out of the disk. That's our point, right? The boundary is the, the circle on the outside. And we can see that in its polygon form. So the only thing I do here in the first step is I put an, a vertex here and a vertex here, and I call this edge A. And I call this edge B. And as you can see, they're not paired, so they're free. And they perfectly form a boundary cycle. Note here that uh, many, many edges together could form one cycle. So it's not just quite enough to count the number of free edges. We will see that in a second, because many of them could form one cycle. But it's exactly our rule now. So if I would show you this slightly boring decomposition, I could not exit through A. I would bump my head, but that's what's supposed to happen, because I would bump it here as well. And I could go on. I could make it finer by putting in more vertices. I could split it, split off another copy, BD, a CD, like doing this. Bop, bop, bop. And then I have A, B, C, D. Oops. And they all form one cycle, and I could, could keep on going, right? So I could split off even more, or whatever. And this is all the same, the same type of object. And we kind of wonder a smart way to decide that. But really, right now, right now, just note that the free edges, the ones that appear once, they're really the way you bump your head. And you're supposed to, because that's what, they, what they're supposed to represent on the polygon. OK. Let's have a look at those guys. Um, the sphere, let's just have a look at the sphere. Uh, the sphere was this object, the soccer ball. Very good. And if you just imagine yourself living on a sphere, like on the surface of the Earth, there is no boundary. You could just walk around wherever you want. You will never bump your, bump your head anywhere. And if you look at the polygon, the same is true, because every edge is paired. So you can never bump your head. If you exit here, you come in here again, uh, whatever. If you try to go out here, you will come in here again. The same is true, for example, for the torus. As you can see, everything is paired. So here would be my torus. If I would really walk around on the torus, I could never I could go like this in the back, come up again, something like this. I would never bump my head. And you can see that on the polygon. Also, here's the polygon. You can see it on a polygon because everything is paired, right? So this was our computer screen, like this, and like this. Same is true for this one and for this one as well. By the very same, I'm not going to draw them. That would be a catastrophe. Uh, but for the very same reason, um, as you can see, there are no free edges in the polygon decomposition. So all of these have no boundary cycles at all. Yeah? All edges are paired, no boundary. 
It's kind of the easy case. All edges paired, no boundary. It's kind of easy to read off. You just look at the, you just search for free edges, and if you don't find any, there's no boundary. So that's pretty good. So here's an example with a boundary. Um, let me at least try to draw the annulus. It's kind of lying on the side here. So here's boundary B. It's a cycle, and here's boundary C. Remember, this is hollow, so I could grab through it, and I'm really thinking about the surface. And if you would now walk on the annulus, you could certainly do something like this. But if you walk to here, you would bump your head. And indeed, you can see that in the polygon decomposition. So I can walk around the annulus. I can walk around the whole of the cylinder. But uh, on either side, I would just bump my head because they are just the pair, the three edges. Right? And now we have two boundary cycles, right? B and C. The Mobius strip is similar. I'm not trying to draw the Mobius strip. Um, so um, let me just pull it up again. How would old friend the Mobius strip? The Mobius strip clearly has a boundary. Come on. Ah, here we go. Here we go. Uh, it's just the boundary of the cycle here that you see. So you would bump your head in one direction, but you're still free to go in the other direction. You can travel around, but you bump your head if you go uh, like this. And that's, um, let me try to catch a good picture. So this is just one cycle. It goes around like this. It goes under and then comes over again. And it goes under and over. So it just has one boundary cycle. And you can better see it in the moment this is glued together. So here you clearly have two boundary cycles. But since we connect them with a little twist, there will be only one boundary cycle. So the Möbius strip has only one boundary cycle. And we kind of, I need to tell you a way to um, kind of see that on the picture, because right now it almost looks like uh, the annulus, which has two boundary cycles. Right? But, well, you bump your head, you bump your head, but you pass through the edge A on the Möbius strip. I hope that's reasonably clear. Right, so this is the easy case, and all of these have no boundary. And then for the boundary case, I need to kind of tell you a good track to, to decide uh, in what type of cycles the edges are ranges. So for the, for the annulus, there are two free edges, and there are two boundary cycles. For the Möbius strip, there are two free edges, but there's only one boundary cycle. So we somehow need to, a better way to decide. Uh, on the polygon, how that actually works. Right, so this is essentially the problem. I give you one of those, and I computer generate them anyway, so you can expect that those show up in any kind of crazy form. Um, so essentially, I only need to give them A, B, C, Ds, and it will generate um, a surface. So we need to somehow decide what is, what is the surface you're seeing. So how could we do that? Well, here's a good start already. We certainly should start counting the free edges. Let me see whether I have done this correct. So A is paired. That's good. Um, B seems to be free. C, I only see one C. D, I only see one D. Uh, H, I only see one H. G is paired. F is paired. E is paired. There you go. It's B, C, D, and H. Okay. So this has boundary. We just need to decide how many boundary cycles. Okay, so first, just have a look at it. What is paired, what is not paired? Pretty simple, very simple. Paired edges imply that some vertices are equal. So let's do that, actually. Okay, so this is what you need to do. This is the algorithm, and we will run that algorithm like 500 million times, and eventually you need to do it yourself. So just watching me doing it it's a combinatorial thing, so eventually you need to do it yourself. But it's certainly, let's do it once. So we need to figure out, and this is kind of deceiving, so we can already see in this picture, let me go back, that some edges appear twice. Right? So this edge clearly is, is this edge. But some vertices might appear twice as well. And I'll show you in a second why. So, so let's, let's number uh, the vertices x and y at the hat of a, and the tail of A. So a hat is, the hat is X and the tail is Y. Okay? So what you can do now, and I wonder what I have done, is, um, no, I swapped them. Uh, anyway, so let's do it the other way around. Let's label the hat Y and the tail X. 
But because the edge A appears down here as well, this little thing here, this little vertex, is equal, equal to this vertex here. They're the same. Because this one is also at the head of A. And similarly, those two are the same. Now it's at the tail of, of uh, A. So these are still the same vertices. And we, we can continue going around. So let me, let's see what we can do. Um, I did a few more, so let's have a look. So this is at the tail of A. Uh, it's, it's like here. And sorry, let me try this one. This is at the head of A. So it's, it's down here. And it's at the tail of C. But C is just what it is. So it, this is just one vertex. And I, this one is at the, OK. So this one is just one vertex. So what we do here is at the, it's at the head of B. B doesn't go anywhere. It's at the head of A. So we jump down here. And the tail of C, but C doesn't go anywhere as well. So this is just what it is. Let me do X for you. OK, so let's start with X. What is a good color? Maybe this one. Uh, so it's at the tail of A. Fine. H doesn't go anywhere. H is just what it is. So that's why we stop. But there's still E. So it's the tail of E. And that's at the, at the tail of F. And that's at the head of E. And this is at the head of C. But C doesn't go anywhere. OK, let me do it again. Because it's a bit confusing. Let me just, oh, sorry, this way. Let me just do it again. So you start somewhere. You, you mark a vertex y. So let's say we mark this vertex y. And let's have a look at the adjacent edges. There's b, but b doesn't go anywhere at 3. So it, it's never paired anywhere. It, it doesn't appear anywhere else. B is, b is done. But let's move in the other direction. a, a is down here. So our vertex is down here as well. And then we look at the next adjacent edge, c. Right? But c is, again, uh, free. So that's where we stop. So the image of y is exactly those two. So those two points represent y. Let's do the same with x, um, maybe in blue. OK, we start here. And let me do it the other way around as before. So we, can, we, we have to check both ways anyway. So let's check e. e is down here. So x needs to be at the tail of e as well. Good. So e is done. But now it's at the tail of f. And f is up here. So x needs to be up here as well. Now it's at the head of E, so it's down here again. But um, then it's at the head of C, but C is free. So we stop at C. We always stop at free edges. Let's have a look at the other way around. It's at the tail of A, so we go here. But H is free, so we stop. And we have traced out the image of the point X. I hope that makes some sense. So you need to do this yourself, but it's actually not so difficult. Just trace out the image of the point of the points. And let's have a look at w. Let's, and when you're done, mark the next point. Okay. Let's mark the next point. Let's call it w. It's at the, uh, it's here, at the head of f. Then it's at the tail of g. Do I do this exactly? So let me just do it completely. So it's here, at the head of f. So it's now at the tail of g. It's now at the head of d, but d is free. So that's where we stop. Um, and it's also at the head of g, and b is free. And that's where we stop. So we've traced now the image of the point w. And there's still one to go, so we still mark that one. And well, that, that goes nowhere. d and f, uh, d and h are both just appearing once. And this is now our polygon. It actually only has, it looks like it has zillions of, of vertices, but it only has four. It only has x and y, and the other ones I call z and w. And that's exactly the same that happens for the edges, just a bit more subtle. Right? You would immediately agree that the edge a just appears twice. So clearly, the bottom edge is the top edge. That's the whole point of the story. But because the bottom edge is the top edge, this vertex needs to be this vertex. And this vertex, maybe a different color, this vertex needs to be this vertex. And then I just tracked it down through the various identifications. And then you can mark all points of the, of the polygon, and you can figure out how many um, vertices it has. Now we know how many vertices it has. We know how many 
edges it has. We just would need to count. So A, B, C, D up to whatever H, I guess. Um, and we clearly see one face in the middle. And that's really good information. We'll see that in a second. Okay. I hope that, that that's, that's clear. So we, we, the edges are, of course, paired or free, depending what they are. So they might appear twice. But the vertices, because of the, exactly the same reason, might appear multiple times as well. So we need to make sure that we know which vertex is which. In this case, we have four vertices only, although it looks like you have, uh, I don't know, 16 of them or something. You only have four, because they are paired along the edges. Right? And that makes sense. If you just would think of this as I glue, I take this in my hand, and I glue A and B together, then those vertices and those vertices are, of course, the same. A and A together, then those vertices are, um, of course, the same. And why do I? go through all this pain and explaining that, because that's essentially what we need to do, and then we are done. Because of the following definition, which hopefully looks familiar, and hopefully has a familiar name, the Euler characteristic. Same as for graphs, but now we are one dimension higher, so we also count the number of faces. Okay, number of vertices minus number of edges plus number of faces. For the graphs, it was my vertices minus edges, but now we have one dimension higher information, so we should take that into account and we count it with a plus. Vertices minus edges plus faces. I repeat that like a million times now. Vertices minus edges plus faces. That's a key formula. The only thing you need to know, essentially. And this one number will essentially determine um, all, all surfaces for us, which is ridiculous. So the only thing we essentially need to do, up to one slight catch, I'm going to do that later. The only thing you need to do is you look at this guy you see a face, fine, we know the number of faces is one. So here, number of faces is one, because it just stares at you, right? It just stares at us, the other face is staring at us. The number of edges, we have A, B, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, so we have eight edges. Number of edges is eight. Very good. And number of vertices, we just computed it, is four. So the Euler characteristic, well, this is maybe black. The Euler characteristic is 4 minus 8 plus 1 is minus 3. And that number, oops, is minus 3. And that number essentially already determines the, the surface. Not quite. I will make a more formal statement in a, in a second. But essentially, that's it. And that's just an extremely fantastic it, it's, we reduce the problem to just looking at polygons, and now it's just a counting on that polygons, because essentially you only want to know one number, this, this uh, Euler characteristic. It's kind of the magic number. Um, so it works in, in dimension one. For the graphs, it works in dimension two. We are not going to do it, but it works in any dimension. It's an absolutely uh, fabulous thing to consider. In higher dimensions, you would, again, take the volumes into account, or the higher volumes or something. But always keep in mind that it keeps track of all data we have in any dimension, so zero dimensional, one dimension, two dimension here, because we are studying two dimensional spaces. So zero dimension, one dimension, and two dimensional objects. The one number you need to remember. And it, that's what I said, right? It, it really is just this, the generalization of the Euler characteristic to one level higher, uh, so we just take the surfaces, uh, the, the faces into account as well. Always be sure in what dimension you are. So for graphs, we count the, first, the, the bottom number, and for surfaces, we count the, the top number. OK, a priori, this depends on the polygon decomposition, because I'm telling you to take a polygon decomposition and count on that polygon decomposition. But I wouldn't make the whole fuss out of the Euler characteristic if it wouldn't be independent. So it really only depends on the surface itself. And you can choose any, uh, any polygon decomposition, and you will always get the same number. Um, but a priori, it does depend. Well, if you just look at the definition, I count vertices, edges, and faces in one particular, um, well, one particular polygon decomposition. OK, let's do it. Let's, let me just pull up all of them our favorite surfaces by now, I hope. So these six will appear all the time. OK, so let's do it for our little friend, uh, the sphere. OK, so this point is x. 
It doesn't go anywhere because it's a, it's a tail at the tail at the same time. This point is a Y. It doesn't go anywhere. It's a tail at the tail, uh, the hat at the hat at the same time. But these two are the same. So we have a maybe W, whatever I called it before. So in this case, we have three vertices. I clearly can see two edges, and I have one face which is staring at me, namely here. So if I haven't, mis if my calculation here is correct, it should come out as two. Good. Let's do one more. Um, what is a good one? Maybe the torus. Let's start here. We mark this edge x. It appears at the bottom of B again, so this is X. It appears at the bottom of A, so this is X. And it appears at the bottom of B, so this is X. And let me draw you the picture. Um, I need a little bit more space so that you believe that this is true. So here's X, 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 and X. And the polygon decomposition that I took, if you remember my animation, where this is just folded together, is the following. So uh, let me try to get this correct colors. So here's the edge A. It's a cut where you cut the torus and just break it open into a cylinder. So that's A. And the B is the other cut around. B, it, it goes around. So the point X is the, the one point you see here where they both meet. So there's really just one point, and we can read it off on the polygon. And on the sphere, I have three points because I have, a, I have the south pole and the north pole and I um, have the, the other connecting them. So that's how I've cut the sphere, if you remember how I cut the sphere. Okay, so here again, the other characteristic is now, I have just one, I still have two edges, and I have one face staring at me, so this is zero. Okay, and if you believe me, this is two and this is zero, we'll see that at the very end of today, um, that the surfaces are homeomorphic. Uh, if they are homeomorphic, then those numbers need to be the same. So two is not zero. So those two surfaces are not homeomorphic. So this is a proof of the fact we all, we all guessed all the way along that the swim ring is not the sphere. We just compute one number, they're not the same, so we are good. Okay. Can we also check that the swim ring is not the projective plane? I mean, that would be a catastrophe if the swim ring would really be a projective plane. Uh, well, it's not, because the Euler characteristic is one. So let's do that calculation. This point, let's call it x, it appears at the bottom of b and at the top of a. So this is just this one. And the other one is y. Top head of b, bottom of uh, head of b. This is y. So what is our calculation now? It's 2 minus 2, I still have a and b, plus 1, so it's 1. So these three are not the same surfaces, and we can just check that by, by a very easy count on the polygon decomposition. Instead of rubbing our head whether there is some continuous map, uh, this homeomorphism type object, we can just check it by computing a number, which is an absolutely amazing kind of fact. And while well, I listed some of the other ones, so you can already see that we are not quite there because the torus is not the Klein bottle, but they have the same number, and we need, to, we need to fix that. So here, this gets zero, and this gets zero as well, so we can't, so what's going on here? Not, not good, right? But we, we will fix that eventually, and it's, it's not very difficult. But essentially, this number is perfect. So whenever you, you ask, is thing A homeomorphic to thing B, compute this number, and usually they're different, and then you can just say, nope, they are not instead of sitting down and trying to write down something in coordinates. Uh, as I said last week, coordinates are kind of, we don't want to do coordinates. And here is a really beautiful way not to think about coordinates. It's kind of a much better answer. You just count. Count a certain number of vertices, edges, and faces, and that's it. Kind of really, really exciting. Up to this slight problem here that we still have the same numbers somewhere. So we will fix that. Um, well, quite soonish. Okay, I hope that's clear. So let me pull up the magic number again because it's really important to keep that in mind. It worked for the graphs already, and it will work here as well. It's absolutely an absolutely fantastic idea. Again, due to Euler. So Euler, one of the uh, <laughs> one of my heroes, one of the biggest names 
uh, that you could ever find anywhere. So what is the order characteristic of this beast? Uh, that's what you're supposed to do. Um, I generate them with a computer, and then you would ask, what is the order characteristic? What is the surface? So what do you need to do is, well, counting the number of faces is always kind of easy. They stare at you, so I see one, stares at us. Counting the number of edges, we again go to, go to H. So that was eight, and we did the count of the vertices, so this is the same as we have done before. So we did the count of the vertices uh, with an X, a Y, a W, and a V. So we have four vertices. So you just piece the information together. Oops. So minus three. Oh, I'm a bit too quick. So minus three is just four minus eight plus one. Right? Exactly the same calculation. Really simple. And we could now decide, for example, that this is not a sphere because the sphere had two. This is not a torus, the torus had zero. This is not a projective plane, the projective plane had a one. Right? It's, it's something different. We'll see eventually what this is. But we can already decide it's not a sphere. Which is, I mean, I don't know how you feel, but for me this is not clear by just staring at the polygon. It could be, um, a priori, it could be a cylinder or something, who knows, because there's some funny gluing involved. Um, but it's not, we just check that very easily. We're just counting vertices edges and faces, which is remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Hope that makes some sense. Okay, I will essentially just sketch the proof of the main theorem. Uh, we don't need to look too closely, but the main theorem will be really, really important. The point is the proof is almost the same as for graphs. It's kind of interesting. So this is uh, kind of a really interesting step uh, one dimension, we go one dimension higher, we need to work a little bit harder because it's, it's a bit more difficult, but we can essentially use the same um, type of arguments. So we have a subdivision. And remember, a subdivision was subdividing edges by putting a vertex on them. And we can now subdivide faces as well because we are one dimension higher by just cutting them in the middle. Whoop, I put another. Um, Edge onto them. Right? We can, for graphs, we can only subdivide vertices. There are no faces. As so I subdivide edges, we have, there are no faces. But now we can subdivide uh, faces as well. And we do this iteratively. So subdivision of subdivision of subdivision. Uh, so we can subdivide and subdivide and get kind of finer uh, structures on your of your polygon. And as you can just see, I mean, what is this adding, subdividing an edge do? It do doesn't change anything of the surface. It just puts another marker on it. It doesn't change anything. And this also just puts another marker on it. We, we will glue along that edge anyway, so it doesn't change anything. In other words, um, they are homeomorphic. So you can subdivide things further, and they stay homeomorphic. So if you start somewhere, you subdivide, you stay homeomorphic, or if you have a large subdivision, and you can kind of undo your process, um, the surfaces will be homeomorphic. And we want to use that, obviously, because subdivision is, was already very powerful for graphs, so it should be really good here um, as well. And it is, it is um, exactly what you need to do. Yeah. Hopefully you remember that lemma from graphs, it is exactly the same, just with S instead of G. So, um, so just the surfaces instead of graphs. So if you have a subdivision, then the Euler characteristic is the same. Okay. And how do we see that? Well, okay. So here, let's do the count. So if you look at this side, whatever it is, locally you have two vertices and one edge. And the number of faces is whatever it is. And here, you have three vertices and two edges. So the successive difference is again the same. We had the same argument um, for the graphs. Now we should check it for the face as well. Here we have whatever how, how many edges there are, the number of sides of the polygon, and we have one face. And now we have whatever edges there are. We added one edge, so it goes up by one, and we have two faces now, so the number of faces goes up by one as well. And that's why, because we, sorry, because we take successive differences, the difference between the two doesn't change. So the Euler characteristic is the same. It's exactly the same argument as for graphs, just about one dimension higher. I hope that makes some sense. And yeah, I just, I just did that again. So, uh, 
what I just said in words is also written on the slides. Both operations preserve the order characteristic. And we're done. Same proof as for graphs, just one extra case to check. It's kind of really, I think this is really, really good. Subdivision doesn't change the number of boundary cycles. So also that stays the same. Well, let's have a look at subdivision. Well, this, oh, sorry, here's subdivision. This operation clearly doesn't affect any boundary cycles at all. It just takes a face, cuts it into half, and you have two paired edges. Um, the top operation is not affecting the number of boundary cycles at all as well. So remember my little picture with the disk? Essentially, what I'm doing is I have those points, I have one boundary cycle, the disk itself, and I put in another marker in the middle. That's what the subdivision does, but the number of cycles stays the same. It's still the same cycle. I just have put another marker on it. So again, um, number of boundary cycles stays the same, and you can just read that off because these are kind of, kind of really easy operations in some sense. Okay, um, and I just, oops. I just put on the slide what I just have said in words. The number of uh, cycles doesn't change under those operations. And it's good. So the Euler characteristic also preserves the number of, of boundary cycles. So it, it will see that number as well. Very good. And, well, okay, let's go back. These are, this is a proposition. You don't really need to remember it, but we will use it now to prove a theorem, and this theorem, I should have called it probably a proposition. The next theorem will be the important one, but this one is also pretty good. The, um, the, the proof, I will show you some nice pictures, is pretty nice, but it's really powerful. So let's say, and it's exactly what we need to do. Let's say we have a surface, and it has two different looking polygon decompositions. Uh, the one with the subscript one, and the one with the subscript two. So I have a a red decomposition and uh, let's say I have a blue decomposition. But then there's a common subdivision of both, which is kind of the correct object to study because subdivision preserves Euler characteristic. This shows that the Euler characteristic is invariant under, um, under the polygon decomposition. In other words, you only ever, you just draw any polygon you want and you just do it and you are sure that you will do the right thing because it's independent of the polygon decomposition, which essentially just follows from the easy fact of, well, <laughs> it's essentially this. It's a really beautiful argument. So, uh, no, no, not quite this. This one, actually. So if you, in, under subdivision, you always add one edge and one vertex, so the Euler characteristic doesn't change, or you add one edge and one face, so the Euler characteristic doesn't change. You never do something crazy like adding five edges and two faces, that never happens. It's always one in one, so the order characteristic always stays the same. It's a very simple and beautiful argument. Now, let's have a look at this theorem. Essentially, what I want to do is the following. So I have my surface, um, so which is a, what is it, the bluish thing on the outside, and I have some polygon form of it, something like this. Uh, so this is Let's say this is the blue one, and this is the red one. So how can you find a common subdivision of bows when you just stack them together? Let me show you the picture. So you have two of them, and you just uh, stack them together. So here's my first one. So this was the blue one. Let me mark it again. Okay, and this is the second one. This is the red one, so let me mark it again. And what we do is we just stack them on top of one another, there you go. Sit on one top of one another and just add the corresponding vertices at intersection points. Right? So here's the intersection point. It doesn't quite make sense, but we can fix that by just adding a vertex here. So that's what we do. So that's why it's a subdivision. And suck, you get a subdivision of the common subdivision of both, which is just put one on top of the other and we're fine. And that's the whole proof. It's a really, actually a really beautiful proof again. So you will always find a common subdivision of anything by just putting them on top of one another, or you can, you can iterate that if you have 10 of them. Just put all on top of one another and add the corresponding um, vertices at the intersection points. Does it make some sense? Okay. And that's the point. 
right? So you don't really need to remember the theorem on how it works, but I just wanted to show you uh, the proof which I found, which I personally find very nice. Uh, but anyway, this is really what, what we want to remember. Suppose that we have uh, homeomorphic surfaces. That's what we want to check. That's what we need to check. And they have polygon decompositions. And they have the same Euler characteristic and the same number of boundary cycles. And it follows exactly from our subdivision argument because subdivision kind of preserves both. So both are preserved under subdivision. Okay. So if we have homeomorphic surfaces, then we have the same Euler characteristic. That's what I already said before. I hope, I hope it was kind of clear. But they also have the same number of boundary cycles. So the second information we want is the number of boundary cycles. Okay. And how do we use that? So we use it in the following way. It's kind of interesting, so let me write it down. So let's say S is homeomorphic to T. And let me just do it for the Euler characteristic. And for the other one, it's the same. And then chi of S is chi of T. Or, so A implies B. A implies B. Let me just write that. So here's A implies B, which is logically equivalent to kind of an interesting trick. Not B implies not A. Oh, this is supposed to be a not. So this funny symbol, this funny angle type symbol is not. So not B implies not A. Yeah? That's logically equivalent. It's called negation. So what can we can do now is we can negate this, what we just proved. So let me negate it. So the negation is, it's pointing in this direction. So not Euler characteristic equal. What is not Euler characteristic equal? It's Euler characteristic different. Yeah? So not, or maybe I use a different color. Let me do it in blue. Pattern. So not Euler characteristic equal is chi s not equal to chi t. Right? It's just the negation of chi s equals chi t. And what is the negation of they are homeomorphic? The negation is they are not homeomorphic. So something like this, and then not. So we have a fantastic tool to check whether things are homeomorphic. Because if the Euler characteristics are not the same, we are already good. They are not homeomorphic by just reversing this argument. I hope, I hope this is reasonably clear. So if they are not the same, we are good. They're not homeomorphic. If the number of boundaries and cycles is not the same, we are good. Then they're not homeomorphic. Okay. So if we go back to our list, do I go back to our list? No, I'm actually proving this, but um, to our list of our favorite surfaces, or the ones that always show up, um, let me get rid of that stuff for a second. Okay. Euler characteristic is not the same, so they won't be the same. That distinguishes, hmm, that shows us that this one is its own class because nothing else has Euler characteristic um, two. So I give it a blue circle. It shows us that this one is its own class because nothing else here on this slide has all our characteristic one. So I give it an orange circle. It shows us that there are two options. Either so those two are either the same or not. And those two are either the same or not. Oh, no, sorry. Um, OK. And this one is its own class. I will do that in a second for you. And this one is its own class. OK, so let's first. They all have Euler characteristic zero, so we, we can't use the Euler characteristic to distinguish them, but we can use the number of boundary cycles. The torus and the Klein bottle don't have boundary cycles, so they cannot be an annulus or a Möbius strip, because those guys have boundary cycles. And if you remember my picture of the annulus, well, the picture of the annulus, I guess, it has two boundary cycles, A and B, and if you remember um, the picture of the Möbius strip, then it just has one boundary cycle. So they are also not the same. And the only thing we can't distinguish right now is the torus and the Klein bottle. So we need to work a bit harder, but we are almost there. So let me come back to the main slide again. Really, the main takeaway message from this whole week 
let me stress it again, too many slides, is that we can check whether two surfaces are the same and it's almost perfect by just looking at a number, the order characteristic, and another number, the number of boundary cycles. By just reversing this argument. Right? So A implies B is logically equivalent to not B implies not A. And the only thing I did is I reversed kind of the argument here. And why is that fantastic? Well, that is fantastic because we reduce the problem. We're almost there. There's one more extra information that I do next week. Uh, sorry, next time. Uh, next week is free. Uh, next week is off. Um, anyway, there's one more extra information, then we are done. And essentially, the last one is really simple. It just takes me a while to set it up. So um, this corollary is kind of the main player of what, we, what we'll do. We reduce the problem from something seemingly very difficult. Remember my first attempt to explain the projective plane? Very difficult object to a question about numbers. So you compute numbers and check whether they're the same or not, which is much easier. You never need to write down any coordinate map between things, kind of homeomorphisms or anything. You can just count vertices, edges, and faces, or um, boundary cycles, which is an absolutely fabulous, I mean, absolutely fabulous outcome of the story. That I personally would have not expected by just looking at the problem in the beginning, like try to distinguish those guys. I would have expected that you need to play around with, with the maps, the homeomorphisms, with some coordinates or something. But no, you don't need it all. Not in a single, not, not, not a single time. Right? Topology is coordinate free. And this is a beautiful example of how topology uh, is coordinate free. Or maybe I should say it wants to be coordinate free. And this is a good example of how it can be coordinate free. Okay, I proved this, but I'm um, running a bit out of time, so let me skip the proof. It's not very exciting. Uh, so the question is, that's exactly what we want to check, right? And then I have it on the slides because it's so important. So in principle, we would need to find this stupid map and its inverse. But no, that is really difficult. That's not what we do. That's writing down some crazy maps not happening. So that's not a good idea. What we rather do is, um, so in principle, we could just do it. But showing that something is hard and not, not equivalent, you would kind of need to rule out that, yeah, no, let's say I try that. I try to show torus is not the sphere. So maybe I start writing down some, some maps, and nothing will work. So eventually, maybe I give up. But that's not really a proof, because maybe I was just too stupid, and I wasn't just able to find the correct map. So showing the converse is usually really difficult, in particular in the original definition of a homeomorphism, which shows continuous maps. Left aside the question that we don't want to write them down anyway. But it, it, it's like, like impossible to decide. That's how it looks like. But we have a really absolutely cool trick. Um, namely, we can just write down the numbers. right? And we just reverse uh, the argument. And the key jargon I want to sell is the notion of an invariant here. So both the Euler characteristic and the number of boundary cycles are invariants of the surface, meaning they don't change under continuous deformations. So you can, they always stay the same. So it's always this direction. It's always an invariant is always the following. Um, so if you have something that is the same, then the invariants are the same. Let me just call it invariant of S equals invariant of t. And invariant, in this case, could mean Euler characteristic or number of boundary cycles. And by our trick from before, we can just reverse the logic. And we get the difficult way, the difficult, mm, this is supposed to be an homeomorphic, the difficult one by just saying this is not equal. Right? So that's what, what we would like to do. We would like to write down invariants. That's kind of the whole idea of topology. Um, and preferably, invariants are easy, like a number or number of boundary cycles. And it turns out that here we don't need uh, much more than that. Yeah. So that's just what I said. So if the numbers are not the same or the number of boundary cycles are not the same, um, then they are not the same. And while we can almost distinguish already our favorite surfaces, note that on my list down here, I, uh, there is no torus because right now we can't really distinguish 
the torus from our little Klein bottle. But we can already almost distinguish everything. And there's one little more extra information we need to do, which I'm going to just do next time. And then we, are, we have kind of a perfect, kind of really a perfect answer to our original question. Instead of looking at those difficult maps, we compute in the end three numbers. And I already showed you two of them, the other characteristic in the number of boundary cycles. There's a third number. And as soon as you have those three numbers, you can determine the surface. And that's just an absolutely fabulous answer, which I'm going to show you just uh, next time. Uh, thank you so much for coming this early Friday. <laughs>